Hello guys, in this video we will be discussing mercantilism and its various aspects like what was the doctrine itself, what were the factors that gave rise to it and how did uh, mercantilism ended, right? To begin with, I should mention that no idea whether it is economic or any other idea does not come out of belief. That is, for idea to come to the mind of the thinkers, philosophers, there must be some conditions prevailing, more so for economic ideas. That is, there are some conditions and those conditions influence the ideas. Ideas also influence uh, the contemporary realities to certain extent. <coughs> but certainly it is the realities that influence the ideas. Now, mercantilism is a very complex phase in the history of economic ideas. Complex in the sense that I mean, till the beginning of the 20th century, not much was uh, known uh, about it, probably uh, because of the lack of research. But later, many things uh, had come uh, to be written about mercantilism and things were documented, etc. Mercantilism is complex because of the fact that although it's a doctrine which seeks a state intervention, to realize certain ends that I will discuss. But those who were advocating this idea or this doctrine were not the organized lot. There were different thinkers who were writing independent of each other in different countries. For example, Malens, Misselden, Thomas Mohn in Britain, uh, Antonio Serra in Italy and perhaps Antonio Serra was the first one whose writings, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it could be termed as, whether he could be termed as the first uh, mercantilist author in a formal sense because his writings uh, probably around 1600, 13 or 14, something like that. Uh, Colbert in France, so in different countries, uh, people were writing. And they were pamphleteers. I mean, they were not writing the uh, article for the journals. They were pamphleteers. They were advocating something. But one thing was common in all of them. That was they all have the desire to uh, have the strong national state. That is another thing was that they considered, they were of the opinion that the a state would become stronger uh, from the accumulation of bullions, that is precious uh, metal like gold and silver. And these, this accumulation would be possible only through when the country has the favorable balance of trade vis-a-vis -vis other countries. I mean, their doctrine of foreign trade was in a sense a zero-sum game that gain of their country will be at the cost of the other one. Uh, and it is for this reason that they had emphasized that a state should frame uh, its policies that would uh, help realize this end. So whether the trade was the end or the nation state was the end, initially even this was blurred. I mean, uh, for the thinkers, I mean, for those who have uh, mentioned uh, the mercantilist, mercantilism. I mean, even this line was not clear as to whether whether they consider bullion and the wealth to be the same thing or whether the strong state was the end or uh, the uh, trade itself or the accumulation of bullion was the, uh, the end. Okay. Further, mercantilism was not the known, was not the term that was used uh, during the time when uh, mercantilism doctrine was uh, uh, prevailing and that was influencing the public policy like anything that was in um, 17th century in till the end of the 18th century to be more proper but even before the 17th century uh, we can have but 
um, for the sake of uh, clarity, I mean, the period is divided between uh, the bullionism and the mercantilism proper. Okay, but these are the later developments uh, to understand as to what the mercantilism was. So, mercantilism primarily was the one that would, uh, I mean, this doctrine can be uh, precisely be written as they all want a strong national state. Okay. They all want accumulation of bullion. that is precious metals, gold and silver and this accumulation would be possible through the favorable balance of trade that is the excess of export of goods over the service, over the imports. Okay. And it is this surplus of export or this is uh, this surplus of export over imports that would result in fetching the bullion for the nation. And in order to achieve this, they would like a state to ensure those conditions in the economy uh, that would result in the uh, that would help uh, securing the exportable surpluses uh, like uh, curbing the uh, practices of usury. That is, in what respect usury is uh, different from uh, the interest? Usury is the, uh, I mean, uh, the excessive or prohibitive uh, uh, rate of interest. So, obviously, for a mercantilist society that required the capital to carry on the trade, uh, this practice uh, would stand uh, as the great impediment to them. So, they wanted a state to uh, curb this, then uh, they wanted trade restrictions. Okay. An implication of all such things was that they also exhorted the states to impose their trade practices on their colonies. So, there was the um, I mean the race for the colonies and to uh, plunder the colonial wealth through uh, the practice of the imposing um, the uh, uh, kind of trade that they wanted. Okay, And there is uh, <coughs> no denying the fact that uh, those countries uh, that had their uh, share of the colonial wealth, they uh, gained immensely uh, from their foreign trade. Okay. But the next question that arises that when mercantilists themselves were not the organized lots, they were not writing in journals, there was no academic interactions amongst them, but still they were writing something that was strikingly common. So what were those factors that gave rise to mercantilism or this kind of thought during this period? Precisely from the beginning of the 17th century to the end of the 18th century, but even before that. Okay. In this context, let us try to find out as to what historical developments were taking place. We know the Middle Ages uh, that prevailed uh, from uh, in throughout Europe uh, from uh, the decline of or from the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, till uh, the end of the uh, 15th uh, century. We know the powerful institutions that existed in the medieval period, though the entire middle age is not termed as the medieval uh, age. Medieval age is the last three or four uh, centuries of the uh, medieval uh, or the middle ages. So, in the medieval age, there were some institutions uh, that were responsible for those things that became the reason for the mercantilist thought. Okay. Now, what these reasons were? 
I should first mention those things and then mention as to what were the contemporary developments that might be responsible for those phenomena. One such thing was the transition to here we are discussing the factors okay factors okay transition to exchange economy okay that is the system of the self-sufficient subsistence local economy was breaking up because now there was the surplus produce as a result of the improvement in means of production and there was the requirement for its market okay so i will elaborate more on it second was the rise of commercial capital that is now there was the emergence and growth of the commercial capital with the help of which the i mean uh, the activities could further uh, i mean uh, that would uh, that would have to be deployed uh, somewhere and trade was uh, the uh, trade was one aspect now these were suppose uh, could be uh, said to be the immediate causes of the mercantilist doctrine although there were some remote causes as well i mean let me go into a bit uh, deeper into that as to what were the circumstances that had prevailed then during the medieval time there were two powerful institutions in the form of the feudalism and church impact of the feudalism was that uh, the nations were divided up into uh, the small uh, feudal uh, uh, domains and uh, subsistence agriculture used to exist uh, production was hardly for the market etc on the intellectual levels there used to be a kind of uh, what is known as scholastic scholasticism uh, that is uh, the Aristotelian uh, logic um, that uh, was the order of the day as far as the intellectual um, discourse was concerned. Okay, together with the particularism that is, uh, you have the liberty to have your views, to have your interest, uh, irrespective of what others. Uh, irrespective of others interest so a society was more uh, i mean close in that sense now as a result of the improvement in the means of production in the techniques of production one thing that had occurred was the overpopulation of the rural economy okay overpopulation of the rural economy uh, had resulted and the rise of commercial capital because for some uh, they uh, necessitated it to uh, invest uh, this thing for the market to produce for the market simultaneously a movement where the big landlords or big owners of the land uh, they would uh, purchase the land of the small farmers and uh, they would enlarge their holdings so as to uh, gain from the large scale production in the form of the economies of scale okay now overall growth of the trade during the time was also facilitated by the maritime discoveries i mean they could be said to be the remote factors okay that is maritime discoveries marine that is i mean America was discovered by Columbus, land route to India, one of the prominent trade destination that was discovered by uh, Vasco de Gama towards the close of the 15th century. Okay, 
that had given boost and motivation for the people to indulge in trade and expand their capital that ultimately led to the industrial capital itself and industrial growth and maritime discoveries uh, and that themselves were facilitated by the improvement in the technology with the help of with the better um, navigation vessels i mean a small device like compass i mean that had revolutionized uh, the uh, navigations so they all resulted in the uh, uh, the growth of uh, the commercial capital and the interest towards the trade. Amongst the remote factor, uh, you can also mention, uh, okay, okay, I failed to mention that the two strong institutions that were there, they were feudalism and church. Sorry. And they uh, the combined effect was that this kind of institution plus the uh, I mean not the involvement in the worldly things not the people's indulgence uh, in the arguments for um, acquiring the material wealth and furthering one's um, I mean uh, furthering one's interest so these institutions became weak especially after the uh, uh, protestant movement um, etc i mean the church uh, church authority began to be uh, questioned in the sense that people started thinking that there is no harm uh, if you accumulate more wealth and uh, you pursue your interest and live the comfortable living uh, rather than just uh, concentrate on uh, the uh, spirituality and uh, i mean uh, uh, just to uh, I mean, uh, just to concentrate on those things and shun the worldly things and they are just uh, not a very good thing. Now, so these uh, things have uh, resulted in the growth of um, uh, these uh, things. And the from the state, they wanted that they should curb the uh, as I have mentioned, they, they should curb the uh, imports and they should promote uh, the exports. Now, so these uh, are the uh, factors that were there and uh, this is the doctrine. Now, when it comes, when it comes to say as to what is precisely the focus of the mercantilist doctrine, one more thing I should mention and uh, that would be uh, pertinent at this point is this term mercantilism itself was not prevailing when this mercantilism doctrine was being uh, put forward. This term was used for the first time by Mayabu, uh, a, a physiocrat, um, I mean uh, with the uh, leader of the physiocrats Quizney, he authored a book also. But it was Smith who had mentioned at length about mercantilism, which he called the mercantile system. It was Smith that mentioned mercantilism is uh, a doctrine related to uh, the favorable balance of trade, uh, trade restrictions, this, that. It was Smith in his uh, uh, Wealth of the Nation and uh, book four of this, he mentioned at length. But still, the mystery around as to whether the state, strong state was the end or the uh, this uh, uh, favorable balance of trade or the accumulation of bullion. It was the, uh, it was Schumuller who uh, towards the uh, close of uh, the uh, 19th century, he had perhaps put this to rest because earlier uh, there is uh, some misapprehension also uh, amongst the uh, thinker that uh, probably mercantilist uh, thought wealth and the bullion uh, to be the same thing or money or the wealth to be I mean to be the same thing etc. It was Schumler who probably put rest and there is almost consensus on that that what is the essence of the system and according to Schumler that uh, he, uh, in the mercantile system I mean it was printed in uh, uh, first 1902 though it was produced in the uh, 80, 80s of uh, the uh, 19th century 
uh, a paper. Uh, uh, so, in the mercantile system and its uh, uh, historical uh, significance, uh, illustrated chiefly from uh, Prussian uh, history, uh, that was uh, the book published by uh, Macmillan and later it was uh, published again in 19, first it was published in 1902, then uh, again in uh, 1967 by uh, Augustus uh, M. Kelly. Now, in this he had mentioned and that is significance, that a sense of a system lies not in some doctrine of money, balance of trade, restrictions on uh, trade, I mean that is trade barrier, I mean the protective duties, etc. I mean you just, I mean notice that he is outright rejecting this, that it does not lie in that. That was the common belief till then. But in something far greater, this is, I mean, Schuller's words, namely the total transformation of society and its institutions. I mean, is uh, talking of the institutions also. That is, he want, I mean, they wanted to have the kind of glo global hegemony. That is uh, something far greater, namely in the transformation of society and its institution in the replacing of local and territorial economic policy by that of the national state. And this assertion of Schumuller, one of the very influential uh, academics of his time um, in Germany. And probably this had put a rest to um, this uh, controversy that uh, what they really wanted and how uh, and this began to be understood in that context that it had influenced public policy greatly for the reason that it suited uh, the uh, uh, states or the uh, governments of the day to overcome their adversaries uh, at home because no system, I mean, uh, when it changes, it changes in a, in a, I mean, a quick fashion. I mean, there is a transition phase, so there is a chaos, so all forces, I mean, resist. Uh, the changes etc. So, it helped uh, those who were at the helm to overcome their uh, rivals at home and international adversaries and uh, go for uh, the colonial wealth. Having discussed uh, the mercantilist doctrine and the factors that gave rise to it, remote as well as the immediate factors. Uh, and uh, the influence of the mercantilist doctrine that had on uh, the contemporary polity or in the public policy. Now it is time to uh, discuss as to how such a powerful doctrine um, had come to an end. Okay? In this uh, context, let me ask you to uh, recall that uh, I mentioned in the beginning that ideas are the product of the contemporary realities, be it economic, social, philosophical, political. I mean, the, uh, these are the contemporary realities uh, because of which the ideas uh, emerge. Though ideas themselves influence the contemporary reality also, but it is uh, the contemporary reality that is important and contemporary reality is something which is not the stationary or the static entity. It is the dynamic one. It keeps on changing. So, what had changed that resulted in mercantilism, mercantilist doctrine or you can call it the mercantilism um, rendering itself uh, the uh, irrelevant such a powerful doctrine that influenced uh, the almost entire West Europe um, that uh, had come to be uh, irrelevant by the end of the 18th century. There were two factors I would uh, call one at the level of the contemporary reality, I mean what uh, uh, the direction of its change and the work that has been carried out at the intellectual level. Okay, So, two uh, reasons I would cite. As mercantilism itself was the product of this significant factor, that rise of commercial capital. Okay? Now, by the 18th century, this uh, commercial capital itself le uh, led to the industrial capital. And 
there was the beginning of industrial revolution started with starting with the britain and then spread to other parts of the west european countries with the industrialization taking place uh, you require the different kind of public policies and the kind of restrictions that mercantilist doctrine had called for they were now uh, proved to be uh, the impediment to the growth of industrialization because now you require the somewhat uh, uh, less sphere non intervention of the government and uh, the free uh, exchange through the market it was in 1776 that when smith published i mean adam smith published his wealth of uh, the nation in which he had although he discussed the mercantilism also with the mercantile system i have mentioned earlier he had demonstrated that that international trade itself is not a zero sum game as mercantilist doctrine uh, thought it to be uh, that i mean zero sum game means where one country's gain is another country's loss but international trade is the positive sum game uh, when the two nations are engaged in trade both stand to gain that is uh, uh, that was uh, demonstrated by smith through his theory of uh, the absolute uh, cost advantage of international uh, trade though even before smith there was another doctrine uh, that was taking shape or though its uh, period of influence uh, was uh, somewhat uh, very uh, limited i mean uh, Uh, about uh, a quarter century or so be uh, because uh, that emerged uh, sometime uh, around uh, the uh, middle of uh, 18th century and uh, um, outlived its utility by the end of the century okay so um, and especially after smith had published uh, his wealth of nations so th that philosophy was the philosophy doctrine of physiocracy so physiocrats this was the movement this was the organized movement that had occurred in france so the idea of laissez faire basically came from uh, the uh, physiocracy smith had also used it smith had also used it smith had demonstrated that besides trade that is where the both nations will gain so it is um, uh, i mean uh, useful for both the nations to trade there is no need to uh, establish one's hegemony over the others simultaneously he had propounded a theory of the uh, market mechanism and what he termed as the invisible hand that it is the self equilibrating capacity or the capability of the market mechanism so there was no need for the government to intervene so this physiocrat doctrine but uh, i would not credit uh, uh, the physiocrat doctrine as much um, uh, to the uh, mercantilist decline as uh, the smiths uh, economics Uh, because a physiocracy uh, lived only for uh, in some limited uh, time period roughly 25 or 30 years and that too in one uh, region of uh, west europe and that is france okay we will talk about physiocracy in some uh, fair amount of detail in some other video so that was uh, the uh, responsible factor the mercantilist doctrine the circumstances Uh, resulted uh, the circumstances that throw this doctrine and it is the change in the circumstances after some time after two centuries almost uh, uh, they dealt a blow to uh, mercantilism and that as a doctrine or that as a prescription for public policy had declined so this is uh, uh, the basics of uh, mercantilism that i wanted to convey to you um, i hope uh, you would like it and uh, if it is so then i would request you to subscribe our channel uh, ez classes uh, so that you could get the uh, notification whenever a new video is uh, uploaded thank you very much